If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 4. Uh, we're going to be reading there in just a few minutes. Uh, but the title today is Remember. Right? Remember his mercy, his love that endures forever. So we need to remember. Hey, let's play a little game. I like playing games. I like having some fun. It's okay to have some fun in church. And so we're going to play a little game. And this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm, it's going to be easy. All you have to do is raise your hand. I'm going to say some things. Do you remember? And then you're just going to raise your hand. Luke, I didn't even say anything yet. Why are you raising your hand? I didn't even start. So the first question was, do you remember the time that you wanted to give me $100? Luke, come on, buddy. I'll see you after service. Uh, but, here, but here's the deal. Do you remember? How many of you, by a show of hands, and those, make sure you, those of you who watch online, play along, all right? How many of you remember losing your first tooth? Yeah, I still remember it. You want to know why? Because I, I was running and I fell into the bumper of a car. <laughs> and, ah, there it is. <laughs> so I remember that one. Uh, how, many of you, how many of you remember that first awkward junior high school dance? <laughs> yeah, where, where you wear the shirt where the collar is 16 sizes too big, right? And you're like, you look like a turtle trying to come out of its shell. And it's, you're just, it's just awkward, but it is what it is. How many of you, by a show of hands, remember your first kiss? As bad as it was, you remember it. All right. How many, how many of you remember your anniversary? Like the day it happened. <laughs> You're like, wait, what day is that? How many years have we been married? How many of you are asking that question right now? You're looking at your spouse going, I think I got it. I'm not sure. All right. I'm, I'm there. I got it. How, re, how many of you remember the birth of your first child? How many of you wish you could get a redo? I'm just kidding. Right? Like, <laughs> Get back in there. Come back out different. All right, you ready for this one? How many of you remember when the Browns won their first Super Bowl? Yeah, yeah, there's a dream. Hey, listen, it's not my fault that the Browns were so before their time that they won all of their championships before the start of the Super Bowl. How can I, right? You know what I'm talking about, Roger, right? Like how many of you, some of you are like, I have no clue. Uh, if you were born before the year 1946, you may not remember, but you were alive when the Browns started winning championships. All right, I just want you to know, Otto Graham, right, the famous Browns quarterback, he won 10, right, AFC, he won 10 divisional titles in a row. How many other teams can do that? Just the Cleveland Browns. Now, I get they haven't won since, but that's not, that's not what we're here talking about. We just want to remember when they won a championship, and they did, okay, 1946 through 1949. They won, all of them, just so you know. Just so you can go back and you can remember the favor of the Lord was once upon Ohio 60, that would have been 75 years ago. Okay, God was good 75 years ago. But let's, let's look this morning about why it's so important for us to remember who God is, to remember the goodness of God, to remember his faithfulness, to remember his mercies, to remember who he is, the love that he has lavished on us as his children. To remember the sacrifice that he made at, at Calvary. Because there's going to be moments in our life where we walk through trials, we walk through struggles. And are, are we able to look back and go, listen, God was faithful then, he'll be faithful now. That's what he's going to do. So if you have your Bibles, let's, let's turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 6 and 7. Some of you are like, the pastor actually owns a Bible. I own a bunch. All right, I usually put it on paper, but this morning I just felt led. Like, we're going to break out the actual paper. We're going to flip some pages here this morning. It says, to serve as a sign among you in the future when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? It says, tell them that they flow, that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be memorial to the people of Israel forever. What were those, the stones that represented? What were they supposed to mean? They were supposed to say, hey, when the next generation comes after you, when the generation after that generation comes, and they see these stones that are piled up, these 12 stones, which represent the 12 tribes of Israel, when they see those stones, they are to remember what God has done in this moment, how the water dried up so we could pass through. This is a time to remember. And I think we can learn something from that text today that we as God's children need to make sure that we are remembering who he is because we will face those moments in our life as well. There's going to be times where you feel dry, where you feel empty, where you feel alone. There's going to be times where you're walking through trials and are you willing to go back and remember 
who God is. So this morning, I'm going to give you four points. So if you like taking notes, you can put four things down. I'm going to give you four points this morning of things that we can remember when walking through tough times. Number one is this. Remember to consider the source. Remember to consider the source. Right? Sometimes we feel, we feel like, man, I'm a I'm not good enough, I'm a horrible person, because we remembered the source was the person who, who pulled out in front of us in traffic and they called us a moron. And so we begin to believe, well, maybe that's who I am because I messed up, I made a mistake, but consider the source. Right? We all have those individuals in our life who, who somehow can be the biggest critic. They can find the bad in every good situation. They, they have no issues with complaining. It's kind of who they are, it's their character, it's their DNA. We have those individuals in our life and it's like, man, we, we just hear them and they spew and, and everything is so negative. Everything is so toxic. And what do we do? We consider the source. Because we just got to go, well, that's, that's just who they are. That's not the reality of the situation. It's not nearly as bad as we thought it was. We're just listening to the wrong voice. But when you have that person in your life who you trust, you know their heart. And they begin to speak and they begin to give, give you nuggets of wisdom. You consider the source and you go, man, maybe I should pay attention. Because if they're saying something, it's probably important for me to listen. Not only is it important for me to listen, maybe it's a life lesson that I will be able to apply to my life. And so you have to consider the source. Or maybe we should just start considering the source. Right? The source. It's like the Ohio State University. Right? It's the source. It's the only source. In Genesis chapter one, it says, in the beginning, God. It does not say, in the beginning, you. It says, in the beginning, God. He didn't need us. He didn't need to put our name in there. Why? Because he's the person who got it started. And it's through him and by him that he started it and he will complete it. Why? Because God is the source and he has the starring role. He doesn't need our help in this, free, this feature presentation, right, to, to, to be the star. He's the star. He's the one who got it started. He, it's his name that is above all names. It's, it's when he speaks that something happens, things appear. In Genesis 1, 11, it says, Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. And it was so. All he had to do was speak it. How many of you wish you had that supernatural ability? <laughs> like, I just speak that money tree in my backyard into existence. Is it there? Right? But God speaks it and it happens. Genesis 120. And God said, let the water team with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. God said it and it was so. Why? Because God is the source. We have limited resources. The person next to you has limited resources. But when we come together to meet with him, we have unlimited resources. It's because it's in him and through him. In our ability, we're here. Maybe way down there, but in his ability, what? We're way up here. Why? Because it's about him. It's about his power. It's about his strength. That's why I love that song. I said it last week. It's my favorite worship course. Why? Because a breakthrough is coming, not because of us, but because of him. It's his power. It's his strength that will set us free. We can't do it on our own. It's only going to be through him. Why? Because he is the source. You can't get where you're going and have what you need if you forget the source. Did you hear me? You cannot get where you're going and have what you need if you forget the source. In Luke chapter 15, there's a beautiful illustration. I, I love when Jesus speaks and he begins to speak in parables. And man, he's talking about the lost sheep and the lost coin. And then we get to this parable of the lost son, right? The prodigal son. And in Luke chapter 15, he gives this story. And in verse, in verse 12, it says, the younger one said to his father, father, Give me my share of this estate. So he divided his property between them. Right? What was the son saying? The son was saying, I don't want what you have. I want it just for myself. So I, wa I, wa I, want, I want my share. I, I don't want you to have my share. I want me to have my share. And, and I'm going to take it because it rightfully belongs to me because it's my stuff. And what's he do? He makes a decision to leave the source. In verse 14, it says that he spent everything and there's a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. Sometimes I think that we get to those moments in our life because that's where God wants us to be. There's, there's some great things that come out of our life because we get to a point in our life where we have a need. 
Some of you would not be where you're at in your relationship with God if you didn't walk through moments in your life where you had needs. Right, you think about maybe that moment that brought you to church because your kids were acting crazy. They were going nuts. They was bad, right? And you're like, man, my kids are so bad. I need to get them into church because maybe church can help them. And it was in that moment you realized, man, it, it wasn't about the church helping them. It was about God helping me, right? And great things happen. And, or maybe you're walking through a difficult time in your marriage and you're like, man, I don't know what's gonna be the fix. We keep trying on our own. We've tried this, we've tried that and nothing seems to work. Maybe we should try going to church together. And then, and then you showed up and then all of a sudden God began moving in your life. And as he moved in your life, he began to move in your marriage because your marriage isn't gonna change until you change. And so God does something amazing. Why? Because there was a need. And it was in that need where God shows up in a miraculous way. And, and so I think sometimes in our life, God is using those moments that where we have needs so that we would remember who he is and that he is the source of all things. You see here, this young Jewish boy, he's like, man, I'm going to go do whatever I have to do and I'm going to live my life and it's going to be great. And he disconnects himself from the source. And now all of a sudden the text says that, man, he's feeding pigs, right? He's feeding pigs. He's eating with the pigs. Why? Because he disconnected himself from the source. He never should have been there in the first place. And all of a sudden, the scripture says that what? He came to his senses. Verse 17, he came to his senses. He finally saw what? Man, whatever it is in me, I'm struggling and, and I don't have enough to do whatever I'm going to do. And, and I keep hustling, I keep working, and it's never good enough. Maybe, maybe I should go back to my father. Now understand, this is a parable. This is a moment where it's like, hey man, do we come to our senses and go, man, I've tried this on my own. I've tried this substance. I've tried that substance. I've been doing everything I could possibly do. Would I, be, would I be willing to go back to my heavenly father to reconnect to the unlimited resource, the unlimited source of power, of strength, and provision? And he makes this speech. He's, he's like, man, I've sinned, and I've tried it my own way, dad. And man, I'm, just hire me as one of your servants, because it'd be better to be a servant in your house than just to live with the pigs. That's I mean, he's willing to just let it go and, and have some humility. And I love it says, the scripture says in verse 20, what, when he was a long way off, right? He was a long way off. His father was looking and his father was filled with compassion. You can trust him when you know his heart is filled with compassion. You can trust a good father when his heart is full of compassion. That when you are a long way off, he is still looking for you. Right? Even though it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter where you were last night, you may be watching online and you just woke up and you're like, man, this is, what I did last night was horrible. The, the, my head is pounding and this pastor is screaming and why am I watching? And God's like, because when you're a far way off, when you're way out there, I'm looking for you. Because I'm looking for you, I'm waiting for you. I'm, I'm waiting for you and when I'm waiting, understand when God the Father is waiting, He's not waiting so you can get to him and he can begin to go, do you know what you did? Do you know what you did? Do you know what you did? You did this, you did this. And he's gonna shame us and he's gonna guilt us and he's just gonna, he's just gonna beat us down. No, the scripture doesn't say that. When he was a far way off, when he's a long way off, the father runs to his son. And this morning, the father is running towards you. He throws his arms around him. Can you imagine in that moment I don't know about you, but I doubt this young man stopped at the local Holiday Inn and showered before he came home. This guy's hanging out with pigs. He's rolling with pigs. He's living in the slop himself. And he comes back to the father, and regardless of his stench, regardless of the sins that he had committed, the father wraps his arms around him. He didn't have time to clean himself up. You don't have the time to clean yourself up. But just understand, in your mess, the father will embrace you. He will hug you. He will lavish his love on you because that's who he is. And so now he's surrounded and all of a sudden the son's like, listen, this is how it's going to be. And in verse 22, it says, quick. What was he trying to tell the son? Shut up, <laughs> right? This isn't about you. This is about me. This is the love that I have from you. And I don't have time to waste. So bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the sandals. We're going to celebrate. We're going to throw a party. Why? Because once what was dead is now alive, to be gone is to be dead. To be separated from the source is to be dead. That's what happens when we separate ourselves from the presence, the power, and the purposes of God. The scripture talks about it all, all the time. The vine, the branches, how we are to stay connected. 
Are we connected to the life-giving source of Jesus Christ this morning? If you take a plant out of the ground, what's it do? It dies. If you take a fish out of water, what happens? It dies. You take the substance from the source and the substance dies. And so we are to be connected. So we need to make sure that no matter what we're going through in this life, that we are remembering the source, remembering the source. The second thing, if you're taking notes, is you, re- you need to remember to put your situation in proper perspective. Because if you don't, life gets out of control. Right? If we don't put what we're walking through in proper perspective, we're going to lose sight of what God is trying to do in us and through us and maybe something he's trying to teach us. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 51, verses 1 through 3, we're going to read it in a minute. But Isaiah is trying to encourage Israel. He's trying to look for, and he's trying to give them words of hope. He's, he's trying to say, listen, you're not always going to be here. You're not always going to be captives in Babylon. You're not always going to be stuck. And what's he trying to say to us? He's like, listen, you're not always going to be stuck on E. You're not always going to feel this empty. You're not always going to, to feel this much shame. You're not always going to feel lonely and guilty. You're not always going to feel the way that you feel. God is wanting us to know, man, listen, it, it, hear me on this. You will not need to stay where you are because I'm going to bring you to where I want you to be. Did you hear me? You don't have to stay where you are because I'm going to bring you where I want you to be. And that's the Father speaking to you. He's ultimately going to bring you where he wants you because that's his love. So Isaiah 51, 1 through 3 says, listen to me. Anytime the word of God says, listen to me, don't you think we should probably listen? I'm just throwing it out there. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were cut and and to the quarry from which you were hewn. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who gave you birth. When I called him to be, he was what? Only one man. And I blessed him and he made him many. The Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. He, he will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving and the sound of singing. He says, listen to me. Listen to me. What I started was with one man. Why? Because I'm the source of all things. And as long as I'm the source, look what I can do. Look what I did through Abraham. And Abraham looked up into the stars and he gets to see everything that God has right, c- created. And he's like, listen, look. Because what I have unlimited resources. Look at the descendants. I love verse 3. It says he has compassion for what? His ruins. What does that mean? That means he has compassion about the broken places in our life. Did you hear me? He has compassion about the broken places in our life. He has compassion knowing that maybe you're walking through something. Maybe, maybe you've lost your job recently. And that's a broken place in your life. The Lord has compassion on you. Maybe you're walking through something and you're struggling in your marriage and you feel like it's broken. The Lord has compassion. You're waiting for a positive report from the doctor and you're like, man, this, is, this feels broken. And God is saying, listen, I have compassion. Maybe you're finding yourself today and you're, you're struggling with, with forgiving something that you've done in the past. God is saying, listen, in those broken places, in those ruined moments, I have compassion Maybe you find your, yourself this morning and your faith is weak. God is saying, I have compassion. You see, when we come to church and we hear a message, when we lift up our hands and worship, and we, when, we hear, when we rub shoulders with each other, it's in that moment that, that God uses a lot of times to be able to help put what we're walking through into perspective. Because we see others and we hear their stories and we know what they've walked through. And we go, man, if God, I, I've heard their story. I know their testimony. I know what you've done in their life. And if you've done it in their life, you will do it in me. Why? Because God is not perplexed by your problems. Did you hear me? God is not perplexed by your problems. It's not like he looks and he's like, I didn't see that coming. I didn't know that that was going to happen. No, God knows what is going to happen. And he's not perplexed. He's not caught off guard by your problems. If God had called Abraham out of nowhere, the same God can can call something out of you when it doesn't even exist. Right? He can call something out of nothing. He did it in Abraham. He can do it in you. You're like, well, how's he going to do that? I don't understand. Why is he going to use me? He can do it in your life. Instead of making your problems known to God, speak to your problems about your God. Right? Instead of just coming to God with all the complaints. And, and, and hear me, he wants to hear him. He wants to hear your heart. But, but what you do is you bring all your problems to God. will speak to your problems about the size of your God. What does that do? It changes your perspective. Why? Because you're starting with the answer instead of the problem. Right? So what's your problem? Well, here it is. Okay, what's the answer? Jesus. Right? So start with Jesus. 
Start with the person of Christ and then speak to your problem. And then you begin to realize, what? I've put this in proper perspective. I'm seeing that the size of my God is so much larger than the size of my problem. But that's what happens when we remember to put it in proper perspective. You see, our situation seems to be bigger when we're standing in front of it, doesn't it? Like when you're a far way off from something, you're like, oh, that's not that big. I remember when I was in Tanzania and we were flying, we were, we were flying through and we're looking through the clouds and uh, the, the pilot speaks and we look out and we're seeing the top of Kilimanjaro. Right? The clouds are here, the top of Kilimanjaro is here. And when we were far away off, I was like, that doesn't look that big. Right? And then all of a sudden we got closer and I went, oh yeah, that's, a, that's much bigger than I thought it was. Why? Because I was standing in front of it. I'm looking at it directly. And whenever we look at it directly, it always seems bigger. You know, when, when I think about David and he's standing in front of Goliath and he sees him in his enormous size, you know, I think in that moment, like, David, what are you thinking? Like, bro, how are you going to defeat what's right in front of you? He's too big. But David wasn't concerned with, with who was in front of him. He was concerned with who was beside him, right? He didn't care the size of the giant. He knew the size of the God who was fighting for him, right? You come at me with all this, your javelin, your spear, you come at, but I'm coming at you in the name of the Lord. And so it wasn't about who was in front of him. It was about who was beside him. So stop looking behind you and start remembering who is beside you. Oh, I thought that would get more amens. Huh. Okay, it was, it was okay. Right? But that's what we do in the middle of our problem. Stop looking. Oh, man, it's so big because it's right in front of you. But remember who fights for you, with you, who's on your side. We remember who's on our side and who's fighting with us. Man, that gives us a whole different perspective. That's a shift in our mindset. Number three, if you're taking notes, remember to keep your mind in perfect peace. Remember to keep your mind in perfect peace. Jesus is preaching this, this series, sermon series. Uh, he comes up with this real creative title uh, called Sermon on the Mount because he was on the mount. So Jesus was really creative. And he's, he's talking about some things that are pretty important. He's talking about lust and adultery and murder. And then all of a sudden he throws in worry. <laughs> Isn't that just Jesus? Hey, we're talking about some really big things and we're going to throw in worry. Really? Okay, this is where we're going. This is a tough transition. But in Matthew 6, 25, what's it say? Do not worry about your life. Sometimes we're like, oh, I just worry about paying my bills. I worry about my children. I worry about dating. And he's like, no, I don't want you to even worry about life. I don't want you to worry about what you're going to eat or drink. I don't even want, to want you to worry about what you, we, you will be clothed with. Look at, look at what's happening. Look at the birds of the air. Again, he does this. He did this with Abraham, and now he's doing it on the Sermon of the Mount. God is always trying to get people to look somewhere other than themselves. Look at the birds. Why? Because you're looking at yourself, and you're going, man, I don't have what it takes. I don't have enough resources. And he's like, no, good. Don't look at yourself. Look at the birds. Aren't they taken care of? If they're taken care of, and I'm taking care of these animals, how much more am I going to take care of you? Aren't you more valuable than this bird? Worry's gonna add a single hour to your life? Of course not. If this is how God is going to clothe the grass of the field that gets mowed just in a couple days, how much more is he going to take care of you? And then he gives us that commandment to what? Not worry. Don't worry. And some of you this morning, you're watching online, you're here in person, and you're like, that's tough. What do you mean I'm not supposed to worry? Man, I, I don't know about you, but it's tough when, you, when you're writing out those bills and you're online and you see, the, you see the balance and then you see the bills that are due and you're like, one plus one ain't equal to two anymore because there's a lot less in this account to pay this account. And you're like, so what's gonna happen? And God's like, I got you, right? I'm going to take care of you. Do we believe in who he is? He's already working on our behalf. But sometimes we run. We're running after God with what already he's working on in us. We're running away from it. We're running towards it. And God's like, I've already worked it out. Would you just trust me? And so we need to get back to what matters most. Most In Matthew 6, it says, but seek what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. It's time we stop building our own kingdoms and start building his kingdom. That's what he's saying. Listen, don't, don't, don't worry about all of this other stuff. But seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, and all these other things are going to be taken care of. But unfortunately, we're so busy pursuing our own kingdom and our own stuff. We're trying to find and accumulate more and more and more so we feel better about our stuff. 
Because that feel, like if I buy more, then I feel satisfied because I have more than others. Or maybe you, you find yourself running after relationships that are toxic. You keep trying to get involved with somebody or, because you're like, listen, when, when, I'm with, when I'm with this woman or I'm with this guy, I feel happy, I feel content, I feel, I feel fulfilled. I just want you to learn. You keep trying it and it keeps failing. Why? Because you're running after the wrong source. You think that some person is going to fill the void that only God can. You, you, you have issues and your issues push you to make wrong choices. And in those wrong choices, you're like, I don't feel fulfilled. But you're not pursuing the right choices and the right person who is the person of God. Because we keep running after the wrong stuff. We keep running after the wrong image. Well, if I was just, if I looked like them... I love the meme, this, the, the little meme that's out now. There's this dude who's probably the biggest dude I've ever seen in life. He's like, right? And, uh, and it says, oh man, one day I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna look like that guy, but maybe a different colored shirt. I don't like the color brown. And this dude's huge and he's wearing a black shirt and you look at it and you're like, that dude's wearing a black shirt, but the old guy who's all weak and, and feeble and frail is standing next to him in a brown shirt. And now you get the joke, right? Like, oh, I, don't, I won't be like that guy, but just in a different color shirt because that's who I'll be is that guy. Like, ah, right? But it's in that moment that we want an image. We want to look like somebody else or we keep trying to fix people allowing, instead of allowing God to fix them. What? Keep your eyes on the source. Worry disconnects you from the source. So somebody asked me the other day, because I used an illustration one time about how my grandma used to iron my grandpa's underwear and then fold them perfectly and put them in his drawer. And they thought I ironed my underwear and then put them in my drawer. That was not me. However, I do have an issue with the iron and the ironing board because I like to iron. Like I iron my t-shirt before I put it on underneath the shirt that the t-shirt you will never see. But I don't want the wrinkles of the t-shirt to make my shirt wrinkled. How many of you think I have an issue? Don't you dare raise your hand. Put your hands down. All you messed up, jacked up people, and you're picking out my flaws this morning. Whatever. Whatever. But how many, how many know there's a time, how many of you have ever done what I've done before? Where you go in, you put your clothes down there on the ironing board, and you start ironing, and you're like, what's wrong with this thing? And it's, the wrinkles aren't coming out anywhere, and there ain't no steam coming out, and I'm like, something's wrong. Who broke my iron? And then I look up at the outlet, and I remember I never plugged it in. Anybody ever done that? Some of you are like, no, because I don't even know where the iron is in my house because I ain't ever ironed. Now what? <laughs> right? But what happens is if, when you disc, if you don't plug the iron into its power source, it has no power. When you pull the plug of your connection to the person of God who has all the power, you will begin to lose your power. So remember, you got to remember to stay connected to the source, and it's easy to forget. That's why you need to remember the disciples had bad memories. And here, it, here if you, you think I'm crazy, in the book of Matthew chapter 14, Jesus feeds 5,000 people, 5,000 men. That's, that's not people, that's 5,000 men. That's not women and children. So it was probably a lot more than that. So he feeds 5,000 men. And then in the next chapter, Matthew 15, the disciples don't know how he's going to feed 4,000. For real? Like in a moment, you just watched me feed 5,000 men and there were leftovers. And now just however, however long, much longer later, like days, weeks, and we're not sure, but, but now you forget? How is it that you forget? Listen, they were with the source and they forgot about the source. They were with him in present with him. Why? They didn't have the peace that they needed in the moment to trust the source. Why? Because they forgot. In order to have the peace of God, you need to remember the goodness of God. Did you hear me? In order to have the peace of God, you need to remember the goodness of God. If he fed the 5,000, why would he not feed the 4,000? If he did it once, why wouldn't he do it again? If, if, he healed, if he healed this individual here, why couldn't he heal this individual here? If he set you free from this addiction, why can't he set you free from this addiction? This, right? But you have to remember to have that peace. Last thing, if you're taking notes, is you need to remember to give thanks. Philippians chapter four, verse six, it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God. Give thanks. Those two words, give thanks, is found in scripture 48 times. I don't know about you. If it's in there 48 times, it's probably important. So we need to give thanks, but thanksgiving is found 30 times. 
So that's 78 times we're to give thanks or to offer thanksgiving. And so we need to remember to give thanks. In the Old Testament, there's an interesting story of King Jehoshaphat. He took an uncommon approach when his enemies were waging war against him. Instead of sending the army in first, he, he, he has this idea from God that he's going to send in the choir. He's going to send in the worship team first. How bad does your worship team have to be? <laughs> right, that they're the first ones to go in and fight? Like, oh man, <laughs> y'all ain't getting it today. Hey, so we're going to go out to war. We're going to have you go first. <laughs> right, that just, you just wouldn't do that. I mean, can you imagine the scenario? Like, hey guys, this is what we're gonna do. I just want you to know there's an enemy out there. They are ready for battle. They're ready to fight. These are well-trained fighters. They have all the weapons and all the skill. And so, man, they are waging war against us. And here's our plan of attack. We're gonna praise them to death. We're gonna sing them to death. This is what's gonna happen. This is the way it's going down. Like, really? That's how we're gonna, this is, this is how we're gonna win this battle. okay. But we need to remember it wasn't Jehoshaphat's idea, it was God's, right? And, it's, and so in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 20, verses 21, it says what, that we need to give thanks. It says, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out to the head of the army saying, give what? Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. I don't know about you, but it would be hard to be walking and marching or running whatever they were doing towards their enemy who's ready for battle and all they're singing and all they're saying is God, you're merciful and your love endures forever. You're merciful, your love endures forever. Don't let us die and your love endures. So that's exactly what they did. They began to sing, they began to give thanks, they began to praise and God sent an ambush against their enemy and the enemy was destroyed. You see, God's people were able to go into this situation giving thanks because they remembered he was in control. So before you ask for more, would you give thanks for what you've already been given? And before you ask for more, would you just take time and say, God, thank you for what you've already given? So this morning as we close, five, I'm gonna give you five points. Some of you are like, bro, you said four and that was number four. How do we give thanks? Number one, if you'd like taking notes, give thanks with your obedience to his word. You know how we can say thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me? You know how we can give thanks, we can remember to give thanks is by being obedient to his word. What does the Lord require of you to act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God? Right, to just be obedient to what he's already said. Some of us, some of us who are watching online, we're, we're, we're in person, we're like, man, I just, I want, I want, I want more. And I listen, I want more of God too. But sometimes he's just being, he's just asking us to be obedient to the knowledge we already have. So would we just give thanks in our obedience? The second thing is we can give thanks with our attitude. I lost some of you right there. To give thanks with your attitude. Is your attitude the same as Christ Jesus? The book of Philippians, right? That our attitude should be the same that is of Christ, that we should put the interest of others before ourselves. Let that soak in for just a second. Can we give thanks with the right attitude? Number three is, can we give thanks with our generosity? We give thanks with our generosity. We see needs, we wanna meet needs. We're generous. If you were to open up your banking account right now, you got the app, I was gonna say maybe you have your checkbook and there's probably one or two that have a checkbook who's balanced this morning. Most of you just have the app and you click the button, right? And you're like, hmm, got money. If you begin to scroll through your last 30 purchases, is it a reflected, reflection of your generosity? We can give thanks with our generosity. We can give thanks with our prayers. Do we give thanks to God for what, he, what he's going to do? What he's already done? How many of you have a prayer journal? You write down what you're praying. How often do you go back and look at the journal and give thanks to God in your prayers for the prayers he's already answered? All right, give thanks in your prayer. The last thing is we can give thanks with our praise. It's a great way. Church, hear me on this. I love, our worship team is phenomenal. 
they do a great job leading us into the presence of God. Man, they're giving it their all. They got, they're such a blessing to us as a church. But if for 15 minutes, 20 minutes on a Sunday morning is the only time that we are giving thanks with our praise, we're missing it. We're missing it. And I hear you. You're like, some of you are like, Pastor Lance, you don't understand. It's hard to sing with this mask on. Yes, I get that. But if the only time you find yourself singing is in a 15 minute window, then is God really worthy of praise? I pulled into the church this morning. I sat in my car. All I did is sat, why? Because there was worship music on. No one was around me and I'm just sitting and I was just thinking of the goodness of God. The song was on, gone. Gone, all my sin is dead and gone. And in that moment, I was just like, God, I'm thankful of what you've done in my life. It was just me and Jesus. I didn't wait to come in and go, you know what? You didn't play the right song, worship team. You were supposed to song with, you were supposed to sing gone so I could give thanks for what God has removed in my life. But you started with raise a hallelujah. I wasn't ready to raise until I give thanks. But you can't wait. So give thanks with your praise. So this is what I'm gonna do. Pastor Kim's gonna come on up and she's gonna close this out in prayer. But here's what you need to remember to do. You need to remember to consider the source. You need to remember to put your situation in proper perspective. You need to keep your mind in perfect peace. And then you need to remember to give thanks. So no matter what you walk through, if you will put those four truths into, into, into practice in your life, if you will remember what God has done, he will do something powerful in you and through you. If only you will remember. Will you remember? So for just a moment, would you close your eyes? Would you bow your heads? I'm just gonna ask Pastor Kim to close us out in prayer this morning, that we would take the time to remember, even in this moment, the goodness 